please be seated. God bless. And thank you for coming to the Middle East meeting. And I know there's other groups. This is the western suburbs of Melbourne. And of course, the western suburbs of Melbourne are marvelously multi-ethnic. Amen? And I lived for the first six years of my 29 years in Melbourne, 29 years in Australia in the western suburbs, left in 1993 and went to Somerville in the Mornington Peninsula for seven years and then to Lynbrook for five years and for the last 10 years to Burwood East. So anyway, can I just invite you afresh on Monday night is the book of Revelation. You're going to get a very, how should we say, helpful presentation. I know it will be inspiring. Not, you know, science fiction, not frightening. It's going to be inspiring. It's going to be topical. And so don't miss it for the world. This is a very special time. I do Revelation all over the world, but it's been a while since I've done it in Melbourne. So it is an opportunity. Can I just say, if nothing else, Revelation 1 verse 3 God gives you a written guarantee. He will bless you if you read and heed this book. So make it a point to come out and learn the book of Revelation in 90 minutes. All right? There are flyers out there, like I think this high. So take a fistful and give them out and get some people to under the teaching of God's prophetic word, which is a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. So we welcome you for that in the book of Revelation. And also just to say, Teach All Nations, which is the acronym TAN, T-A-N, a TAN if you're Chinese, TAN if you're not. And it's, uh, we, please visit us anytime. Many resources for free there. Not everything's free, but many for free. And that's TAN, T-A-N dot O-R-G dot A-U. TAN org A-U. That's actually my Chinese name as well. TAN org AU. So, ni hao ma tan org ao. The other thing is we do have teaching resource because, you know, what can I do in 45 minutes? I can do a lot, but there's so much more. If you're interested, just visit outside. We have, this is brand new, just launched tonight, the Book of Hebrews, verse-by-verse -verse commentary, MP3 audio, 20 hours of commentary with, I'm looking how many pages here, about... I think it's 80 pages of printable notes on top. So everything you hear is in writing as well. We do the note taking for you. If you're hungry for the word, why not Hebrews? Because basically Hebrews is telling us that Jesus Christ is best of all. Better promises, better covenant, better sacrifice, better everything. And we're doing the Middle East. We have DVDs. This is on Turkey. You're going to hear a little bit about Turkey tonight, but if you want more about this very important nation of Turkey, then you get the DVD. We have At the Door, which is about world trends, key nations of the world, and Bible prophecy. If you like both these topics, then get At the Door, which, by the way, is also available Amazon Kindle. And then, also, if you're interested in the Middle East, this is my Magnus Opum. It's the largest book I've written. Don't be scared by a large book, by the way. Anyone here not scared by large books? A few, like maybe 20 of you. Okay. Don't be afraid of large books. This is a great introduction to the Middle East, and it also takes you on a Holy Land tour, all right? From Melbourne to Jerusalem. Tonight, we're, because it's uh, published in 2008, we're moving it on, so it's only $5 for this. Only $5, and everything else is $15 or four for 50, or there's even more if you get more. Everything goes to mission, friends. But the thing is, they're very, it's not that expensive for what you're actually getting. So thank you for that. And can I also say two other things? On the 9th of May, I'm having my public meeting. I've been doing it for eight years. This is a public meeting too, but this is like, we get people from everywhere coming. And I'm talking about destination Europe. There is a migrant flow, indeed a migrant flood, coming to Europe. Most of them are Muslim. I have stood at this pulpit, and I will say it again, Muslim people are some of the nicest people you'll ever meet. 
for sure. But nevertheless, they're coming to a culture very, very different. What does it mean for the European Union? What does it mean for the Middle East, including Israel and the Jews? What does it mean for the world? And what does Bible prophecy have to say? I will touch a little bit on that prophecy tonight, just a little bit, to whet your appetite for the 9th of May. And so it'll be at the Grow Church in Ringwood. We will give you the details. No problem. It's on our website, tan.org.al. But also, if you want to hear it from us, we'll send you the details by email. No problem. The brochure has, uh, the flyer has been printed, but we don't have it tonight. We want to invite you to that. And just remember the other thing. We take people to the Middle East every year. And we have tours to Turkey, Greece. That's a book of Revelation. And we also have them to the Bible Adventure Tour, Egypt, Jordan, and Israel. More information, my wife Leanne can help you on that. Thank you very much. Well, tonight I'm going to speak on the Middle East. And for all those that speak Arabic, I will greet you now. Ehwati behaikum beisim Yeshua. Okay, shukran. All right, I just said, brothers and sisters, I greet you in the name of Jesus. I will just tell you my background. My background is my father was from British mandated Palestine, born in Jerusalem, born in the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem. He, Arab man, very, very clever man. I, in fact, uh, incredibly clever. He learned the King's English, and at the age of 22, he goes to the U.S. consulate in East Jerusalem, and he charms his way to a visa to the United States. Had no money. Now, but he still, he smiled, he, very convincing, and he, got, he came to America, met my Lebanese mother there in America. They were married. Years later, I was born, and... Uh, the rest is history. Well, actually, nothing was history. I was raised fully American. I was not raised to speak Arabic. My mother forbade anyone to teach me Arabic. She felt it would hold me back in school. So I didn't learn any Arabic as a child. And then uh, I basically was an American. I was an American in an Arab body, essentially. And then after I came to faith in Jesus and I told my story to the men, I found a Gideon's Bible in the family bookshelf and there everything changed 15 years old i gave myself to the lord was baptized in the holy spirit at 20 gave myself to missions at 21 and within five months oh by the way i gave myself for mission to the lord 21 years old then i thought well what do i do next how do i go on mission i'm nobody told me nobody was sponsoring me nobody gave me a pentecostal handshake how am i going to get to the mission field and you know what happened how i got there it's actually unbelievably simple and amusing nobody tell me how to do it because i don't think they knew how to do it either so i got a teaching tape from joy dawson a kiwi lady who works with ywam for a hundred years and she she the, the teaching tape said waiting on god waiting on god so i listened to the tape because she's kiwi she's practical just like aussies are practical I listened a dozen times to that tape, How to Wait on God. I did what she said, and guess what? The door opened, and I ended up, of all places, in Israel. All places. The little Arab guy is in Israel. I went, did a master's degree there, met my wife from Geelong. <laughs> a Geelong wife. No, I didn't go to Geelong to find a wife. Geelong came to Jerusalem. And we were met in Jerusalem, married in Jerusalem. In fact, we met on Mount Zion, married on Mount Zion. I did a master's on Mount Zion, and I started preaching on Mount Zion. Ministry started, master started, marriage started on Mount Zion. It's a real place, not very big, by the way. You would think it sounds huge with all the things I did there. It's very small. And so that's where it began. Tonight, I want to speak to you a few minutes about the Middle East in the light of God's word. I'm not going to talk politics. I know the politics very well, but I've learned living in Australia. I think most of you may know by now, just look at the $5 note, just look at the coins, that Australia is a constitutional monarchy, not a republic. 
And one of the benefits of a constitutional monarchy is that the head of state, which is the queen slash governor general, is not a politician. They are above politics. They represent everybody. Look what's happening in the United States just right now. But actually what's happening in the United States right now is happening all the time. The United States is a republic. Who is the head of state? The president. Is the president a politician? Yes. Which means at least 40% of Americans do not like their head of state at any given time. 40%, that's a lot of people. And uh, I would dare say with this election, it will probably be even higher. All right, so we don't have that in Australia. And one of the things the head of state is very adept at is staying above the politics. They know the politics, but they don't get involved. It's like eagles. They soar in the sky. They don't, you know, go in the barnyard where the chickens are. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be like the monarch, above the politics. With that in mind, let me read to you from the book of Joshua, chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. So we lay a foundation for the Middle East and a touching on Bible prophecy. The book of Joshua, chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. And this is Joshua on the eve of taking Jericho. He has crossed through the Jordan River as on dry land. He's now, his feet are in the land of Canaan, hasn't conquered anything, he's built an altar at Gilgal. And this is what happened. Joshua 5, 13 to 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand, and Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Meaning the Canaanites in Jericho. So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped him and said, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandals off your feet or foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Let's pray. Father, help us to have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. Help us have a greater awareness of the Middle East, a greater interest, concern, and compassion. And Father, I do pray that you will open people's hearts to not only the good seed of your word, but to the wonderful flow of your Holy Spirit. Because we know that when the word and the spirit come together, there is empowerment and there is equipping and there is exceeding great blessing. For this we thank you in Christ's glorious name and all the people of faith said, Amen. Amen. Friends, what happened here is so amazing. You actually got God coming down and appearing before Joshua. Possibly, probably a pre-incarnate form of Jesus. It wasn't just a man. It wasn't just even an angel. You don't take your shoes off because the angel comes. You take your shoes off when God comes. And, it is, and even though Joshua was called from the chosen people, and he was coming into the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Please note, he's asking God, are you for us? Are you for them? The answer is neither. I'm not for you. I'm not for them. I'm not here to take sides. I am here to take over because basically the kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, it's righteousness, peace, and joy. The kingdom of God is redeemed Jewish people and redeemed Gentile people. One new man, no wall of partition, so on and so forth. Having said that, why is this place? Not, I'm not just talking about the Holy Land, I'm talking about the Middle East. Why is it so important? 
I want to give you a few key reasons. Well, first of all, when you hear this phrase, Middle East, you normally think of oil. Lots of oil. In fact, oceans of oil under sand and surf. It is estimated that 69% of all the world's oil comes from the Middle East. 69%. And, of course, it has put the place on the map. It has enriched the coffers of certain key nations. But I want to tell you that sometimes when you are resource rich, it doesn't mean your country will be rich. Sometimes it's the countries that are not resource rich, for example, Switzerland, that are doing far better economically than the ones that are resource rich. Think of Nigeria. Nigeria's got tons of oil, but they don't even have one world-class hospital in Nigeria. When the president gets sick, he goes somewhere else. With all that oil money, that is a problem. But of course, Nigeria also has a serious corruption issue, and that explains it. The Middle East has lots of oil, but the oil is relatively recent. This is an ancient part of the world. And the oil comes and the oil goes too. So what is the second reason that it's so important? Well, if you ever look on a map, it sits right in the center of it all. It is like the navel of the world. In fact, the nation of Israel, it's very tiny, by the way, but it is the land bridge between Africa and Eurasia. You cannot go by land from Africa to Eurasia except you go through the Holy Land. You, there's, there's no other way. And actually, there is a highway that goes through. It's closed and has been since 1948. But Isaiah 19 says that highway will open again from Egypt to Assyria via Israel. So it is centrally located. That's why there's the Suez Canal there. The Suez Canal cuts travel from going around the Horn of Africa, not just the Horn, sorry, not the Horn, the Hump of Africa and the Cape of Good Hope. You don't even have to do that if you want to go from Europe to India. But also because it's centrally located, the distances are much closer than in Australia. Istanbul to Tel Aviv is only an hour and a half flight. That's closer than Melbourne and Brisbane. And think of it, the migrant flow or even migrant invasion that's currently happening from the Middle East is possible because Europe and Asia are next door neighbors. I have taken groups to Turkey for the book of Revelation and you can literally off the Turkish coast see the Greek islands. What you're going to understand is if the migrants at least this is how it was last year. It's now tightening up. If you can get your toe on a Greek island, you have access to 25 other European countries, technically, without a passport. I'll explain that, hopefully, in a moment. So the center location means that the Middle East and Europe, as neighbors, have had a lot to do with each other. Because... Well, that's just because of the geography. The third reason it's important is the most important reason of all. It has to do with theology. This is the land of the Bible. Not just Israel, Jordan as well, Egypt as well, a light, tiny bit of Syria and Lebanon. Turkey is replete with biblical association. Not only do you have the seven churches of Asia, you have the missionary journeys of Paul happening in Turkey. You have some famous epistles addressing churches that are now in the area we call Turkey, like Ephesians or Galatians or Colossians. This is all in Turkey. And it's, it is the land of the Bible. It, and shall I say, theology, be it Judeo-Christian or Islamic is the greatest export of the Middle East, more than the oil. It's called the belief in one God, monotheism. That has, that has been, it is birthed there. Needless to say, the Middle East is also highly religious. 
Not like Australia, laid back, secular, and larrikin. The Middle East is so religious. I say they've had thousands of years of experience. If you, and I say tongue in cheek, want to live the religious life, then just pack your bags and go to the other side of the world. They will teach you how to be religious. But chances are you'll lose your sense of humor. You'll live an austere, have an austere diet. You will uh, have to wear certain clothing. And it's interesting how some of the different, the Jews and the Muslims in particular, some of the clothing and some of the way they dress is so similar. And some of the actions, so similar. In fact, they have more in common than they care to admit. And some of the religious Christians too. And as I said to the men this morning, if being religious could give peace, then this region should be the most peaceful place on earth. On the contrary, it is not the most peaceful place. And there's reasons for that too. Now, having shared all this, let me take you on a little tour of some of the key countries. Only some. If I don't mention a country, it doesn't mean I don't think it's important. I only have a few minutes. So, by the way, I, at Bible college level, I taught on the Middle East, and it was a 39-hour Subject and even then it was an introduction This is a very deep rich place. So let me take you a few key countries first country. I want to take you to is Iran. I Don't know how many you've ever met Iranian people. They are very friendly very charming highly intelligent wonderful cuisine and They will make sure you remember they are not Arabs don't confuse them with Arabs. They're not Arabs, okay? It's like saying that the French are British. No, no way. Same. Iranian people have an amazing heritage in their country. They had an empire that was the largest, I think, of all the ancient empires, the Persian Empire, in the Bible. They had some very enlightened, despotic, you know, ancient rulers too. A high culture, and they keep reminding people, we are cultured. And they are. What is not so well known is that in their modern history, they actually did have attempts at democracy. Serious attempts, like commendable attempts, which in the Middle East is impressive because the Middle East is a democracy-challenged part of the world. Amazingly, breathtakingly, is that they had an elected prime minister in Iran in 1953, and he was overthrown by the Americans and the British. This is during the Cold War. The rationale was a couple things. Uh, I think the superpowers wanted a bit of the Iranian oil, but also more so they said, oh, look, this guy, this prime minister, he's not a communist. But we're afraid he might become a communist. And they had him removed. And let me tell you, in the Middle East, they've got long, strong memories. They do not forget, and they do not forgive. So when the American hostages were taken decades later in 1979, that is one of the things that was brought up. We had a democracy, and you took it from us. The Middle East. It invites meddling because of the reasons I told, the oil and the central location. Iran is incredibly important. It's not well understood at all. And normally when you hear about it in the news, it's, it is negative. But the thing is that first of all, Iran or Persia, it only was called Iran in 1935. Prior to that, it was called Persia. And many Iranians don't even call themselves Iranians. They call themselves Persians. But the thing is, the name Iran, 1935, means land of the Aryans. Aryans. Now, who was in power in Germany in 1935? Hitler. And what did Hitler want? A pure Aryan race. Iran means land of the Aryans. The Iranians are not Semitic, they are Indo-European. So there is some connection somehow. Nevertheless, in the book of Jeremiah, it talks about Elam, E-L-A-M. 
Elam is going to, in the last days, have a real shaking from the Lord. But they will have a turn, and God will bless. Even though Iran has been the leader of radical Islam and an Islamic revolution since 1979, by the way, Khomeini, in my opinion, he's the founding father of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Remember, when Khomeini took over in 1979, he had unseated a monarchy that had been in Iran for 2,500 years. That is a long time. From the time of Cyrus the Great, who's in the Bible, 2,500-year-old monarchy overthrown by the Islamic Revolution of Khomeini. And Khomeini is really, not that I think he's a wonderful person or have any comment to make about his character, but he's certainly influential. He didn't just affect Iran. He didn't just affect the Middle East. He didn't just affect the Shia Muslims, which are 15%. He affected the whole Muslim world. I personally believe it was Khomeini that started the trend of women covering their heads, even if they're not Shia, they're Sunni. Because before Khomeini, many Muslim women, you could see their hair. Before Khomeini, Muslim women might even shake your hand. Now, proof, no handshake, no hair, all covered. And by the way, if a woman, Muslim woman covers her hair, doesn't mean she's religious, any more than if a European woman wears a cross on a necklace, that means that she's religious. Not necessarily. Many of them are not. They just are under great peer pressure to conform. And Iran's nuclear program, as you may know, it has been under great scrutiny because of the fear that Iran would become a nuclear weaponized nation. They have said, we will not do that. That's against our religion and so on and so forth. Apparently, nobody believed them. That's why there were sanctions by the US European Union and the United Nations. Well, there was a nuclear agreement, as you know, last year. Under the Obama administration, the sanctions were lifted, and $150 billion has been released for Iran to pretty much do what she wants. So we do need to watch Iran, Elam, E-L-A-M. But the good news, friends, out of Iran is that it has the fastest growing national church in the entire world, bar none. And just like China, <laughs> it's growing faster than the Chinese church. And the, the miracle is that the things we take for granted today, like evangelism, church planting, Sunday school, printing Bibles, all of that's illegal in the Islamic Republic of Iran. And even though it's illegal, it's happening day after day after day. When China went communist, we thought the church would go backward, although I wasn't around, neither were many of you, but the church has gone forward, despite communism. Part of the reason we think the church going forward is the printing and distribution of Bibles in China. And the same is happening in Iran too. So pray for the Iranian church. They're under great affliction, and yet they've got amazing joy. Because true joy doesn't come by circumstance, friends. It comes by your relationship with God and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Another country I'll mention is Iraq. Iraq has, is the neighbor of Iran. It is considered an Arab nation, unlike Iran. Iraq has had five world empires on its soil. Five. Five world empires. Like Akkadian or Sumerian, like the first Babylonian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the second Babylonian Empire with Nebuchadnezzar and the prophet Daniel, and then years later, the Abbasid Islamic Empire. Five world empires on its soil, but probably the single most important place, biblically, historically, is Babylon. Babylon was the greatest city of antiquity. And Babylon had mouth-watering dimensions and a very splendid infrastructure. Basically, it was called the city of gold. Gold everywhere, 
hanging gardens, pagan temples, amazing palaces. And we know this because over 100 years ago, Germany started to excavate Babylon. Iraq has such a rich history. We think the Garden of Eden may have been there somewhere. Noah may have been running around somewhere there in ancient Mesopotamia. But the thing is they have half a million archaeological sites. Only 5% of them, 25,000, have been identified. And of the 25,000, only 5,000 have been excavated. And thank God Babylon was one of them. But just remember, Babylon isn't just a great city. Babylon, Genesis 11, was a place of the tower. The Tower of Babel wasn't just, you know, how should I say, an archaeological, no, uh, architectural wonder, you know, in the top there'd be a revolving restaurant to enjoy the view. No, no, no. Tower of Babel was a heathen shrine full of idolatry. Basically, it represented rebellion against the living God. And Babylon is considered the birthplace of false religion that was exported to the east and to the west, to Egypt, to Greece, to Rome, and even beyond. When we talk about Babylon, don't just think of the past. You see, there are seven chapters in Scripture that talk about the fall of Babylon. Seven. And two of them are in the New Testament. When we think of this, there's two possibilities that I can think of. If we can take the scripture at face value, and there's no reason why not, Babylon will be destroyed in the future. Well, the question is, well, you mean Babylon in Iraq? For a long time, there was no Babylon in Iraq, just an archaeological site. But Saddam Hussein, back in the 1980s, began to rebuild the city of Babylon. It even has its own area code. He rebuilt the walls. He rebuilt the gates. He rebuilt the palaces. He rebuilt the temples. I think he even worshipped in some of those heathen temples. Very versatile man. Muslim, Sunni, worshipping in heathen temples. And it's still there. Will Iraq get rid of ISIS on its territory? build up its oil wealth, become prosperous. Many Iraqis want Iraq to be even more flourishing than the Emirates and Singapore. I actually said that the, the I, I said it like, how should I say, not prophesying, but I said that Iraq wants to be like the Emirates and Singapore. And sure enough, uh, later down the track, I found a quote from a parliamentarian of Iraq. We will get, we will build our economy. We will be greater than Singapore and the Emirates. If that happens, then just watch this page. But there is another possibility. When the Germans excavated Babylon, you know what they did? They imported it to Germany. They imported the processional way the Ishtar Gate with its, I think, 317 monsters on the Ishtar Gate. Monster demons on that gate. Very beautiful, but demonic. And the altar at Pergamum. Now, remember in Revelation chapter 2, Pergamum was called where Satan's seat dwells. I can take you to Pergamum, like I've been doing the last few years, and show you where that altar was. It was there in Pergamum. But where is it today? In Berlin, capital of Germany. When Kaiser Wilhelm II, 100 years ago, brought the altar of Pergamum, he said, this is the proudest day of my entire reign. This is called the seat of of Satan. Think of Tower of Babel. Think of rebellion. Think of false religion. Think of the demons that could be there. And they took it from Iraq to Germany. Isn't that interesting? As soon as they put the altar of Pergamon there, there was a declaration a year later or so saying that the Pentecostal movement was from the devil. It's called the Berlin Declaration 1909. 
They brought some more things from Iraq, from Babylon to Berlin. And guess what happened? It literally within months, the Great War broke out, World War I. And who started? The Germans. And then they moved the Ishtar Gate in 1929-1930 from Babylon to Berlin. And guess who comes to power two or three years later? Adolf Hitler. Maybe Babylon is either in Iraq or Babylon is in Berlin. And don't forget the European Union. And I'll talk more about this on the 9th of May. But their parliament in Strasbourg. I don't have the photo now. I'll certainly show you the photo on the 9th of May. It's built to look like the Tower of Babel. No exaggeration. It looks like a ziggurat from the Tower of Babel. When someone was questioned, you know what they said? Oh, yes, we want to complete the job that our ancestors failed to do several thousand years ago. The word Europe, the Christian continent, it was the Christian continent. That's why there's a cathedral on every street corner. It was very Christian. But Europe, the name comes from a Greek goddess called Europa. And Europa, the story goes, she was very beautiful and she met Zeus or Jupiter, the same as he's the father of all the gods. And Jupiter thought oh, the lust began to boil when he saw Europa. So he turns into a white bull, Jupiter. And Europa gets and sits on the bull and she's riding the bull. He dives into the Mediterranean and he rapes Europa. She has children by him and all this kind of thing. It is so amazing. Get a Euro coin, maybe from Greece, not every Euro coin, and you'll see Europa, she's riding on the bull. This is from Greek mythology. You will see her statue in several key places of the European Union. The European Union apparently is going pagan. There's going to be a referendum in Britain, 23rd of June. It's called the Brexit re referendum. What should they, they're going to vote to stay in or out of the EU. All I want to tell you is every European, I'm sorry, every British Christian I have asked, without exception, says, we want out, including our own son-in-law. He's British. His name's Michael. He wants out. They, every single one. And this is part of the reason. But remember Revelation 17, the woman rides the beast. We are called to be prophetic people. Most people are sleeping and drunken. First Thessalonians 5, God saying, watch and be sober. Quickly take you to Turkey and Israel. Turkey is probably the most important country to watch. It is very misunderstood or little understood. It's a fascinating place. It's got the best food in Europe by far. But more than that, it's the history. It's amazing. It is the place of the seven churches. It is the place of Galatia. It is the place of Colossae. It is the place of Ephesus and all these things. Time fails me to give you even the, the most simple explanation. But let me put it this way. Turkey has had several major empires, the last being the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was so big, it basically occupied most of North Africa, all of the Middle East, and even Southeastern Europe. That's why we have white European Muslims, Bosnians, Kosovars, Albanians. They were all made Muslim courtesy of the Turks. But the Turks are not your average Muslims. They are different. They are Sunni Muslims, but even they're not like the normal Sunnis because they've had many centuries of other religions and they've built on those religions. They've got many mosques in Turkey, but they're usually not very full because nearly a century ago when Turkey lost the Great War and the empire collapsed after 600 years, a man rose up. He's the one that faced our diggers at Anzac Cove and he won the only victory for Turkey on Turkey's soil, and his name is Ataturk. 
Ataturk is one of the most successful revolutionaries of history. He took this feudal, religious, backward place called Turkey, and he yanked it into the 20th century. But to do that, he abolished Islamic law, Sharia. He abolished the caliphate. He abolished the Arabic script and put Roman script, what we use in English. He changed everything. He made it secular, Western-leaning, Europeanized, and that's how Turkey is till now. It is the most unique Islamic country that we can know. And, of course, now Turkey is applying to go in the European Union. And Europe really doesn't want them. They say Turks really aren't Europeans and they're different to us and da, 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 you know. But lately, Europe has warmed up to Turkey to stop the flow of the migrants. Now listen to this, Mrs. Merkel, and you'll hear more again on the 9th of May. She is probably singularly the most influential one that caused 1.1 million migrants to come to Europe last year. She basically gave the wink and the nod, and they came flooding in. Mrs. Merkel is, has done a deal, we think. I don't know the full deal. We're watching. But allegedly, she has promised Turkey, if you will, we'll give you billions of euros to take these guys back, and we'll let your citizens have free access to Europe. The Schengen Agreement, 26 countries, no passports needed. Now think about it. To stop another million migrants, Europe is going to allow 78 million Turks free range? Do you understand what's going on here? To stop a million more, they'll let 78 million come. You all come down now. We'll just watch and see. Finally, with Israel, modern Israel, it is one of the unique countries of the world. Now, from an Arab point of view, when they hear Israel and Zionism, it's a source of great, for many, not all, great anger and great pain. I do know the Arab side on this very well. But I've learned to be a Christian above all else. I've learned to go what the Bible says. Again, it's not to take a political stance. But friends, we live in prophetic times. We live in the last days. Of that, the Bible is very, very clear. And modern Israel is a remarkable story of restoration. The Bible speaks about restoration of all things. Acts 3, 19 to 21. Please do not have to take my word. You search for it yourself. And many things have been restored. But one of the things is, let me give you a little prophetic heads up. What are we to expect in the future revolving Israel? You see, Israel is the place where Messiah came. When Messiah was crucified... His crime was being king of the Jews. The king of the Jews is not just to rule over the Jews. The king of the Jews is going to rule the whole world. He'll be the first and only one to ever rule the whole world. Many have tried to rule the whole world. And they may go only so far and then they fail. This one will succeed. For the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness of the world. Because the Lord Jesus is coming back, he's going to have his kingdom. He's going to rule from Jerusalem. He's going to rule the whole world in righteousness and peace and joy. Is it any wonder this puny little postage stamp of real estate and this tiny city of Jerusalem, much smaller than Melbourne, is the center of the hurricane? Because, just read the second psalm. I think I spoke on the second psalm at Southwest. Then you'll understand why the heathen rage and the people imagine the thing. The king is coming back to Zion. That's why there's all this controversy, rise of anti-Semitism, wars and rumors of wars, and so on. Real quickly, what might we expect in the future? Psalm 83. Psalm 83 speaks about an invasion of Israel 
by the neighboring countries, with the notable exception of Egypt. It's not mentioned at all in this invasion. Even though Egypt is the biggest neighbor, it's the strongest neighbor, but it's not mentioned. Psalm 83. After Psalm 83 is Gog and Magog. Ezekiel 38 and 39. Fascinating prophecy of a last day's invasion of Israel, not by her neighbors, but by a second ring of antagonists. Gog in the far north, many think it's Russia. The Russians don't think it's Russia, but many others do. Followed by a coalition with Put, which is Libya. is an interesting Libya is falling apart. The Islamic State has taken over part of Libya. It's a very dangerous situation. And I'm not sure about who else is there. There's rebels and all. Oh, it's a mess. There is Kush. Could that be Ethiopia? Could that be Sudan? We're not exactly sure. But the third one is Persia. That we are sure. Kush, Put, and Persia teaming up with Gog with a spontaneous, unprovoked invasion of Israel so massive that basically Israel will be finished, except for the fact fire comes out of heaven and devours the invasionary force. What else? We also have the prophecy of Armageddon. There is a valley in the north of Israel. It's called the Valley of Armageddon. The only thing about this valley, it's very big, it's very sobering, but there's nothing to battle in this valley. It's agricultural. There's no major cities there. Even Tel Megiddo is now a ruin. There's no city of Megiddo anymore. So what is the purpose of Armageddon? Well, remember Revelation 16, 16. It says he gathered them in a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. It's a gathering place. The battle is probably Jerusalem. Then we read in the same context, Zechariah 12 and 14. It basically says that in the end, the whole world, not just the Arab world, the whole world will go to war against Judah and Jerusalem. This would have been inconceivable a few decades ago. Who was going to battle over a city of stone, stone walls, no natural resources, not even a population of a million people, not on any major roads or major ports? Or Who's going to battle over that? Well, you know what? Palestine, Israel, Jerusalem has been the number one issue of the United Nations. They were dominating like one-third of all UN resolutions. Why? Because the king is coming back. The Lord says in Zechariah 12 and 14, I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. Who's gathering them? God is. And then the nations will come and they will invade Jerusalem. But it goes on to say, then the Lord will come and fight against those nations as he fought in the day of battle. Do you see? It's very simple. God's going to gather the nations like Armageddon, and then he's going to come down and fight them. When it says the Lord will come down and fight, who are we talking about? You don't have to whisper. Thank you. Jesus is going to come down. And though we will be with him, apparently he will fight this battle on his own. And then it says, after he wins his battle, his feet will stand in that day on the Mount of Olives. Game over. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and Christ. Friends, I've tried not to be political. God loves everybody. At least it's not just Arabs. Not just Arabs and Jews. We have the Turks. We have the Kurds. We have the Armenians, we have the Assyrians, we have all kinds of people groups there, and God loves them all. And we need to pray for them, especially for the persecuted church. Pray for the persecuted. They were having trouble even before the Islamic State came. Pray for the persecuted church, and if the Holy Spirit tells you, 
advocate for them. Contact congressmen and church leaders. And I've done that, and I think it would be good if you guys did too. But just remember this. In the place where the Bible first began is where history will finally culminate. And it's important, friends, that we are not, as I said earlier, 1 Thessalonians 5, that we're not sleeping spiritually. Sleepers are the people who, in the things of the world, they're wide awake, but the things of God, they are hibernating. Drunkards are people who live in constant denial, deception, in many cases, narcissism. They are oblivious to what is going on around them. You don't want to live like that. You want to watch and be sober. But to do that, you first of all have to be born again. Second, you have to work with the Holy Spirit and know God's word. And third, you've got to follow Jesus Christ with all of your heart all of the time. Friends, if you're a two-timing, half-baked, double-minded person, you are not going to be future ready. And these events can possibly overtake. But if, on the other hand, you recognize that your hope and your future is in God, then you're going to do the right thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the fear of the Lord means we hear God and we obey God. For more information about Southwest Christian Church, visit our website, 